Happy Monday, everybody, on this March 25th, 2024. This is Liz Ann Live, and my name is Joe Mazzola. I am the host, and joining me today is Mr. Kevin Gordon. Kevin, how you doing, buddy? I'm good. How are you, Joe? Good to be back. I'm very well, and it's nice to have uh, have you with us today, filling in for Liz Ann, so we absolutely appreciate that. Um, Kevin, let's just do this. Let's get right into disclosures. you got a ton of stuff to cover today. Uh, a lot of it is on housing, so we'll spend mm -hmm. some time talking about housing. We'll get your thoughts on the, uh, the FOMC meeting from last week amongst other things like client questions or viewer questions when they come in. And by the way, everybody, if you have questions, look on the far right of your screen. There's a box there for you to ask those questions. Uh, we will um, be answering those as as, as quickly as we can. Uh, we try to get to as many of those as we can. So please be patient with us uh, when it comes to that. First things first, so you'll see the have uh, disclosures on your screen now. Just know that anything that Kevin and I talk about today is really for informational purposes only and is not meant to be investment advice. Okay, Kevin, let's talk about the week. Um, today we had new home sales. I came in a little bit light, and that's uh, going to be one of the things that we talk about today is just um, uh, the, the housing market. But we'll get to that momentarily. What I want to do is really kind of talk about uh, the rest of the week and the holiday shortened week, which just happens to have PCE released on a Friday when... Uh, now, does PCE world. get released? Does it make a noise when no one's there to trade it? I guess is the question, right? I know it's cruel. We have no no trading on on uh, on the day that PCE comes out, and it's not just I mean, you know it's personal income, personal spending, sure. savings rate. It's a huge you know it's a big package of data when you get PCE. So I suppose we'll just wait until Monday uh, for the reaction. But maybe there's no reaction because you'll have you know everybody will have had the weekend to uh, to digest it. But I, I think uh, you know that that's the that's the dominant focus. I mean, there's other there's other stuff this week. There's actually a huge uh, slew of data inclusive of like you mentioned home sales uh the rest of the regional pmis roll in we got dallas mm -hmm. this morning um so kansas city and richmond also come in and then we've got durable goods orders um for february those are always a bit dated but you know they do help us uh sort of gauge where business investment is and and where the trend is especially when you start to factor out things like like transportation so it, sure. it's an important data week but i think um probably rightfully so all of the attention is going to be on the uh, on the pce data yeah, yeah, you're right. And let's not forget Thursday. We got jobless claims, Univer University of Michigan consumer sentiment, and then the uh, the third reading of GDP. So yeah, yeah. a good amount to pack. And by the way, the, the, I forgot to mention. I'm glad you mentioned GDP because this is now the one that we get um, the fourth quarter for GDI, gross domestic income, which a lot. You know, normally we wouldn't be just, you know, so excited about that. I'm always excited about it, but not everybody would be as excited <laughs> about it because. Um, you know, there's this big gap that's that's yes. opened up between GDP and GDI. GDI has been more suggestive that the economy has actually been a lot weaker over the past couple of years, call it. And GDP has been suggestive of the opposite, that we've actually seen a lot of strength. So it's going to be interesting. Um, hopefully, it's not just a flat number and we continue to have this divergence. But yeah. if you get more catch up from GDI, it sort of bolsters the case that things have been more resilient. Um, if you continue to see the spread between the two, I think it actually puts more pressure on sort of the focus around first quarter GDP because estimates have started to come down a little bit faster, just given some of the softer consumer spending data. So I think that that is actually going to be uh, really important to look out for in the GDP report this week. And we did see a revision downward in the Atlanta GDP now, did we not? Uh, yes. Yeah, it's come down to low 2% range. So, you know, that that always fluctuates a lot. But before, yeah. I think we were upper 3%, uh, you know, with a, definitely with a three handle and it was firm close to four. So um, we've come down quite a bit. And most of that has been due to the softer consumer spending data. But for the most part, 2%, um, 2.1% is still really good. I mean, you're kind of around trend there. And that's that's uh, that's pretty resilient in, in the Fed's eyes, too. And it might be something that uh, the Fed looks at as, as a good thing if you see that that could that number cool a bit. All right. Well, let's get to your data and let's get to what uh, you put together for us. The slides here. Let's start off with some key updates or, you know, we did get some key updates from the housing sector last week. Hard and soft data perspective. I want to get, Kevin, your takeaways uh, first on the survey side. Yeah, so first um, few charts that we're covering today will be all the survey stuff. And this is from NAHB, the, the Home Builder Sentiment um, you know, Housing Market Index that they put out each month. 
one of the probably the best leading indicator, especially for housing, but you know, for the for the overall economy itself um, that we can find. And for those who may not be as familiar, because it goes back a few years now, this was one of the indicators. This headline index that we're showing was one of the first to really dip into its own recession after after the COVID recession. So you can see if you look at that far red shading, um, the really thin bar. Um, which encompasses the COVID recession. Right after that, you started to see the stumble, and then it really just took a you know just took a dive in 2022. So this was kind of the first uh, thing to to enter its own recession, and we say its own recession because of course this wasn't unless the NBER comes out and says mm -hmm. that there was a recession last year. This wasn't consistent with an economic recession. So the good news is that we're starting to see more of a durable bounce back. The bad news is, is that we did start to see that last year, summer into fall, and that proved to be a massive head fake. I think for other reasons that I'll mention in a bit, um, when I think a couple of charts later, this is a little bit more of a durable bounce, but we have started to see, you know, sort of a nice trend over the past few months. And that has at least, you know, it bodes well for, for the broader health of the housing market. All right. Well, so Kevin, something's got to, Something's got to give to kind of grease the wheels of uh, of the housing market. And, you know, I wonder if that's either mortgage rates uh, or prices coming down because both of them are holding fairly firm right now. And now there's pockets, right? There's pockets of weakness. You actually see it out where I live in the Bay Area. Now you start to see prices come down a bit. But which do you believe is more likely to occur in the in the near term? Maybe a drop in mortgage rates or a drop in home prices? Um, you know, I'd probably say the mortgage rates, I, I, they have come down a little bit, depends on which metric you're looking at. If you're looking at a catch all 30 year metric from a Freddie Mac, uh, that, that one's come in quite a bit recently. But, you know, mortgage rates, it's, it's kind of a game of do you focus more on rate of change or do you focus more on level? I think for a lot of home buyers who are newer, um, maybe the younger millennial crowd, um, they're probably waiting for, for mortgage rates to fall back down to what they were just a couple of years ago. That's very different for, you know, the crowd that's older than they the millennial waiting. crowd that, you know, uh, is, is kind of used to mortgage rates being more elevated. Yeah. So yeah. rate of change might be more of a focus there. So I think that uh, if, if the Fed is going to ease this year at some point and cut rates, then, yeah, it's probably going to be mortgage rates. As long as the labor market stays as resilient as, as it has been, um, I think that's going to be consistent with home prices continuing to move higher. And you still have existing home prices uh, making all-time highs, uh, new all-time highs consistently every month. So I'm not sure, you know, absent some sort of massive recession, I'm not sure you're going to, which, you know, in that case, there's probably not going to be a lot of a lot of buyers for homes. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure that the price uh, sort of cooling is going to is going to come before the mortgage rate cooling. Okay. Uh, let's take a look at home builder confidence. In your opinion, why are builders feeling more confident? Um, I, I, do we still see demand outstripping supply? Yeah, this is an interesting chart because you're looking at you know the future sales component in blue here, which is how builders see the the sales environment. Um, you know, looking ahead, kind of six to twelve months, and then you're comparing that with the orange line, which is prospective buyers' traffic. So that's kind of at the consumer end, at the buyer end and looking at confidence there. And there's a pretty big split between these two. Um, you know, the blue line is almost always above the orange line. So I wouldn't look at it that way. I would look at it when you see that reading, you know, 62 for blue, um, that's kind of coming near the, the peak that you saw last year. But when you look at 34 for prospective buyers traffic, that is still below the peak that you saw last year. It's also nowhere near its all time high that you saw before the um, right after the pandemic. So the, the buyer stuff is not improving as much many, you know, for the reasons that we, we just discussed. I think sure. on the builder side, though, there's a lot more alleviation on the input cost side and the materials okay. shortage and everything that happened in 2021. So that's a great point. So it's Maybe the builders don't feel that um, you know the, the demand will be there right away, but what they what they've started to at least uh, what they've started to notice or what they're seeing on their bottom line is they're not paying as nearly as much for the input prices. They don't deal; they're not dealing nearly as much with the labor shortages. So they have the builders, they have the materials that they need. Now they just need uh, mortgage rates to come down a little bit more yeah. so they can get the buyers to step in. Okay, and that makes sense. The other thing too for home builders, I mean, that's really the new home market that it's capturing. So when you right. think about the fact that existing, the existing home market has, for you know more or less been frozen for the past few years. Um, I mean, sales have tanked down to recessionary levels. There's not a whole lot of price discovery going on there because a lot of people just aren't selling their homes and, you know, yeah. conversely, not a lot of people are buying. So with a really tight existing home market, tight supply, which we have a chart on later, I know, that's pushed a lot of people into the new home market. So I think that's one of the reasons that home builder sentiment and home builder stocks, you can see it captured in stock prices too, sure. um, has done, you know, has done pretty relatively well. 
Um, is that going to last in perpetuity? You know, nobody knows the answer to that. But for, for now, as long as you're having more alleviation on the price and the input cost um, stamp, you know, stuff from the standpoint of the home builder, um, that still bodes well for confidence. I think that's one of the underpinnings under the house, housing market, um, especially on the new side. Okay. Uh, one of the things that you and I have talked about in the past many times, and you know, Lizanne and I have talked about many times as well, is the leading economic index of the LEI. Uh, are we starting to see what may be a bottoming after, what is it now, 17 months, so 18 months or so in decline? Oh, well, if you're if you're looking at consecutive um, monthly declines for the LEI, we got to, I think it was 25. Oof. So we were, we were at, you know, it's the second longest streak on record. And it's notable only because when we got the data last week for, for February, the LEI in month over month terms, um, it finally ticked up for the first time since early 2022. So, um, you know, it's, it's a pretty notable move. It wasn't a massive increase, um, but now you can start to see the year over year trend improve a little bit, which is in the bottom panel of this. Um, of this chart in orange and we're still down so you know don't get me wrong down 6.3 percent year over year that's not great however the change in the rate of change is is much more important for an index like this and when you're comparing it to something like home builder sentiment on the top panel in blue this is one of the reasons i think that maybe the move is a bit more durable this time not to say that we go into this epic expansion for home builder sentiment but it's at least supported by the fact that other leading indicators not just housing yeah. itself are starting to support this move so maybe it takes away kind of the likely the, the likelihood of a second head fake. Maybe we're starting to see something that's real that has you know some potential uh, uh, you know to, to build upon as we as we kind of move forward. That's All right, right. Uh, hard data. Let's look at some of the hard housing data that you got. Where what are you seeing in terms of the commensurate strength here? Yeah. So you know what's what's good is that in this amidst this entire kind of housing freeze, um, housing starts and building permits, which are two of the most leading indicators on the hard data side. Mm -hmm. And building permits is actually a part, is a component, a subcomponent within the LEI. So the the orange line here is is pretty key to watch, um, and it's generally less volatile than the housing starts data, which is in blue. But you know, both of these for the past year and a half have have kind of kept their uptrends, which is nice. Um, it's been a little bit stronger for building permits, hasn't been as strong for, for housing starts. Uh, but this has been a really sort of key, I think, um, sort of trend in keeping the housing market intact. And what's been more important is kind of the message that it sends under the surface. So I know I'm skipping ahead by one chart, but I think that this chart is kind of the exclamation point when you look at the recent strength in some of the building permit and housing data. So if you go to the next one, the spread that we're seeing between the number of homes that are completed and then the number that are un under construction actually jumped into positive territory for February. Um, you know, a lot of that was due to almost strength, almost entirely on the multifamily side, not in the single family side. Yep. Single oh, family, you know, has, has more to do with GDP. So it's a much stronger, you know, thing to look at, but still, you had a jump into positive territory here. Hopefully it lasts as a trend, but I think it's notable because number one, it's the first jump into positive territory for a few years. This has kind of been the post pandemic norm to stay negative. Um, and number two, this was one of the sort of key contributors in my opinion to a, a really tight affordability, uh, you know, really terrible uh, affordability market for, for new home buyers. So if you're starting to get into a scenario where we are building more, but we're also completing more at the same time, and at a better rate for the latter, um, then I think that probably starts to alleviate some of the price pressure. It's not going to happen overnight, but these trends tend to exacerbate moves in the future. You know, much like we saw in 2020, when you look at this chart and we originally dropped into negative territory a few years ago, um, you could see the knock on effects from a price perspective today. So I think that it starts to give some positive signals, but again, not to expect it to happen overnight. That would be a little bit of a pipe dream. And the multifamily uh, units would have a more positive effect in terms of uh, uh, price declines, right? Make it an affordability index. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. makes sense. Okay, great. Um, let's move forward here. I want to take a look at home price gains. Uh, and you're, you're showing that it's back in black. Interestingly yes. enough, um, let's say you get a drop in mortgage rates. You know, we're starting to see it, but, but let, let's say it carries forward. There's been there's been some conversations back and forth that if that is something that we'll see, you're going to get a flood of buyers in the market that's going to push the uh, push the housing prices back up. Is there some inflection point in terms of maybe what that interest rate is where you might see some uh, so a little bit of equilibrium there? Or is it like it gets back down to five percent and boom, there's so many people back in there that it pushes these housing prices back up? Yeah. 
I mean, I wish there was a magic. Le- I mean, we all wish there was a magical level. But the yeah. the other component to it is that you kind of need, you need the income and the and the wealth component to it too. So how how strong are incomes? You know, how strong is actual real income growth? Which if it stays at current levels, then yeah, I think that if you got more of a drop in mortgage rates that wasn't commensurate with some sort of economic weakness, yep. um, then yeah, I think that would be great. But at the same time, you're still dealing with a tight supply market. So as I mentioned earlier, the bottom portion of this chart, the blue line is just looking at monthly supply for existing single family homes. So this is the the majority of the housing market. It's anywhere from 60 to 70% of the US housing market. So the, the reading here in the scale when it says 2.8, that just means that if you take the current selling price, the sales mm-hmm. pace that we have right now for the existing single family home market, um, it would just take 2.8 months to clear all of that inventory. That's really low relative to history, as you could see. Um, we have been in a bit of a secular decline, you know, post financial crisis. But the rub is that this is happening at a time when price growth is still reaccelerating, which is shown in the top panel. And not only that, but when you look at the dip that we saw during the pandemic, you know, kind of after the pandemic. Um, after that spike near 40%, it was really short and it was really shallow. Um, so you didn't really get much time as a new home buyer if you were going into the you know into the used market. Um, you weren't really getting that much time to sort of seize on those uh, on those times when uh, you know home prices were relatively low uh, compared to their peak. So you would need supply to improve a lot more, which it, it has over the past couple of years. But mm-hmm. going from 1.9 to 2.8 is is not as much of a you know a material bad. increase or improvement. Okay. All right, let's switch gears a little bit, and I'm going to get your take on the FOMC meeting uh, from the prior week. We do have some questions that came in. They're not housing-related, so I'm going to hold off on those until we get uh, maybe a little bit later in our conversation. But uh, what were your key takeaways from last week's FOMC meeting, uh, and what about your thoughts on how the market responded? Yeah, so prior to the press conference, that you know, all the attention was on the summary of economic projections, yeah. um, which got updated for, for March. So the most recent update was December. They they do this four times a year, the all the Fed officials, all 19 of them. And you know, I I, I want to preface and emphasize that this is not a policy prescription. So I think often, you know, the SCP comes out and people say, Oh my gosh, this is what they've changed their um, you know, sort of bias towards, right. or this is exactly what they're gonna do for the year and then the following year. That's really not the case. They're just taking, you know, whether they're writing it down on pencil or using Microsoft Excel or whatever program. Um, They're just sort of putting in their estimate each individual member and saying what they think is going to happen for the year. So all the attention went to the GDP estimate, which you could see in the first red box that we have here for this year, growth going up from 1.4 percent in December to 2.1 percent as of March. And then, um, you know, at the same time, a little bit of an upgrade or a downgrade, depending on how you look at it for core PCE this year. So originally 2.4 percent as of December, now 2.6 percent. Um, for for um, for March for for all of 2024, where we're expected to end this year. So that, in conjunction with the fact that the Fed really didn't adjust its outlook for rate cuts this year, when you're looking at you know the amalgamation of estimates, I think trips some people up. But Absolutely. at the same time, you know, I would emphasize again that this is not something that they're just going to follow strictly. Nor is it the path that the economy is going to follow. Um, you know, the forecasting record for the Fed um, for for GD for things like GDP is not strong. So I would pay much more attention to the incoming data and the leading indicators to tell you what the path of GDP is going to be. That was a very kind and politically correct way of saying that they're not always <laughs> they're not always right in their projections. None of us are always right. So you know we're all in the same boat. <laughs> we are all in the same boat. It's a hard guys. job forecasting. It, absolutely, I agree. All right, uh, let's take a look at those cuts and how that's kind of moved out. And and this I think this was interesting, at least in my perspective, uh, for the market's response. You, you know, you, you continue to hear from Powell. They're still looking for the potential for three cuts, uh, but yet everything else was ratcheted up, as you mentioned, right? The GDP number was ratcheted up. Uh, core PCE was ratcheted up. So I think the, the market, it, at least my interpretation was, the market saw that as a, as a cue that, hey, the, the economy could hold up. We don't need a recession. We don't need a recession to get these cuts. And I think that that was a pretty important signal. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of the signal that the market has been giving year to date where you can see. So from this chart, you know, this is just looking at the number of cuts that the market's expecting for any given year. So we're looking for 2024 here. You know, back in mid-January, you got up to close to seven that that were priced in. 
Now, four of those have been priced out. So as of, I took this data Saturday morning. So, you know, we're looking at just over three, just more than three cuts for this year, um, all while the, you know, major indexes have have really not struggled at all this year. So, you know, the max drawdown for the S&P so far this year has been down 1.7%. That hasn't been with a lot of churn under the surface, which I know you've covered with Lausanne recently. But mm-hmm. you know, for all intents and purposes, the, the market, if you're going to use it in index, if you're going to look at it in, in index terms, um, has, has has been relatively resilient and and done relatively well. Um, I think it's for a couple of reasons, not least being the fact that rates and the move in rates hasn't been as hostile to to stocks, that that relationship has kind of broken down a little bit this year, you know, where the 10 year has been able to trend higher, so have at least U.S. large cap stocks, not the same story for small caps. Um, But I think also at the same time that in this kind of readjustment and digestion phase for the market, trying to figure out what Fed policy is going to look like this year, um, the realization, I think, you know, in in a good sense that the the economy, the real economy, can handle relatively high rates um, that stay restrictive for now. Um, but there's still an expectation that the Fed is going to ease. So I think that if there was a no cutting scenario, you know, maybe it gets met with a little bit of of a more digestive uh, kind of painful selling phase. But still, I think that if they're holding rates and if the if the economic data continue to roll in like they have. Um, that's probably the best case scenario. Certainly when you compare it to an aggressive cutting cycle where the Fed is taking us um, you know, down really quickly, taking the elevator down, so to speak. Sure, sure. Well, speaking of economic data, the aforementioned PCE, we talked about it's going to come out on Friday. And if it falls in the middle of the forest and nobody's there to trade it, uh, does it matter? What do you think? Yeah, well, I will be watching it. So maybe I'm standing next to the, next to the lone tree. Um, but no, you know, the good news about this is, and this was this chart really just reflects, I think, what was the, the tone of the meeting and the tone of the press conference that Powell gave, where they're not sending an all clear on, you know, uncertainty around inflation. So looking at risks to, to PC, core PCE inflation, which is the blue line here, um, you know, it's still relatively elevated. But then you look mm-hmm. at risks to GDP, which is in orange, and this is just measuring how many members it's a diffusion index so it's just looking at you know are more members uh worried about it or not um up until you know this this past meeting for march uh it was more members were worried about gdp growth now you have it flipping back into positive territory per, per the orange line so that's a good mix to have um you obviously don't want to have inflation risk elevated as much as it is but I'll take that combined with you know a better outlook for gdp mm-hmm. versus the other way around so i think that's that's an important sort of nuance within some of the Fed thinking, especially when you start to listen to, you know, some of the member speeches of late. Right. And in this final slide, before we get to the questions, kind of goes along with that in terms of uh, the uncertainty regarding inflation. And and this is important, not just from the member's perspective in terms of what they're how they're looking at inflation, but also in terms of consumer sentiment. I know that that's something when we talk about the UMIS consumer sentiment number, we say, hey, you know, you got to look at what uh, consumer uh, expectations are for inf- inflation going forward. So everybody wants to see this number come down, correct? Oh, absolutely. And if, if you're just focusing on the orange line here, this is the number of FOMC members that are reporting higher uncertainty about core PCE inflation. So it's trending lower. So the trend is in the right spot. But in level terms, you're still significantly elevated mm-hmm. relative to history. And there's not a long history of this. They only started tracking this in, in late 2011. So unfortunately, we don't have a long history. But I think this is consistent with what you're saying, Joe, where consumers are still really worried about it. Yeah, the trend has probably improved for the majority of the consumer base. But in level terms, there is still this adjustment period that's going on, especially when you're comparing price levels, not rates of change, price levels back to you know yeah. late 2019, early 2020. Yeah, yeah. Well, the rate of change might be going down, but I think we all know that the levels have not uh, receded that That's much. Right. All right, I'm going to get some uh, viewer questions here. Let's start off with John. John says, "Hey, Kevin, why is oil not higher uh, given the geopolitical conflicts that we're seeing?" Um, I, you know, probably. Oh man, that's a it's a tough one because there's so many competing forces right now. I, I yeah. think that the the broader commodity complex, not just oil, um, notwithstanding some things like cocoa, because I know cocoa prices are are soaring right now um, for reasons I I don't know. Uh, but Easter I think bunnies because of the there, Easter there you bunnies. go. Exactly, we've solved it then. Um, <laughs> I think for for oil in general, it's probably more. I mean, it's still I think more of a of a weaker demand story out of major markets like yeah. like China. Um, but also from a supply perspective, um, you know, things are not as tight. So you kind of have both of those levers working in in a good uh, in a good direction. But I will say, 
um, you know, there's you're going into a, a stronger seasonal period for oil. I'm not the biggest believer in seasonals driving everything, but that combined with the fact that you have started to see energy stocks reawaken and be the best sure. performers month to date, um, maybe that's more of a signal that there is commensurate strength coming from from oil. You're also going into the you know the summer driving season, at least in the case of the United States. So there's more demand there. Uh, but at the same time, you know, shocks to oil prices, especially to the upside mean a lot less to the economy today than they did, you know, a couple of decades ago, even mm -hmm. five or 10 years ago, especially when we've become sort of the net producer of oil for, for the U.S. Um, so I think that if there is any solace in that or any comfort in that, uh, maybe it's that fact. I uh, just wanted to wanted to expand on the point you were just talking about with energy being uh, one of the best performing sectors. Ninety six percent of the components yep. above the 50 day moving average, 91% above the 200 day. Uh, energy has been where, uh, excuse my pun, but you've seen uh, it, the money flow, so to speak. Yeah. I thought you were gonna say it's where you see the energy. So that, that's, that's uh, I like, I like that. <laughs> that would have been better. No, that would have been better. I'm sorry. You know what's you know what's fascinating, Joe, is I hear so much about, oh my gosh, energy stocks have been so horrible, but it's it's really just a game or an exercise of what your time frame is. Yes. If you go back to the, the markets you know, prior all time high back in back in January of 2022, the energy sector is up, I think, 62 or 63 percent. It is far outpacing every other sector. So yep. it just kind of depends on, you know, what you're using as your as your start point, which I know is always the thing with investing. But it's interesting Absolutely. to square that with, you know, some of the commentary lately. No, you got it. All right. Uh, this is from Bennett. Bennett says, Kevin, uh, what do you see the dot? Where do you where do you see the dollar in the next few years uh, with all the conflicts in the world? It seems like there's a push to make the dollar weaker. Uh, what and what are the best sectors to invest with a lower dollar? So maybe I don't know. Choose one or two of those. That's a, that's a lot well, to unpack. I'll do all of them. I mean, I'll take it in okay. reverse. If you're going to look at the correlations between the dollar strength and and you know sector performance from an earnings perspective, materials and tech actually have the strongest inverse correlation to the dollar, just because a lot of those companies, um, you know, more than fifty percent of for those sectors, um, they have revenue coming from overseas. So, you know, if you want a little bit of a contrarian play, um, there is an idea, but at the same time, you know, it's it's always tough just taking the entire sector like the tech sector and just betting against it. So um, I, I would do a lot more fundamental analysis than just, you know, where the dollar is going. Sure. Uh, you know, from a macro perspective, I, I get the fact that there are, you know, more transactions taking place, especially between, you know, China, India, Russia for, you know, within oil, you know, in, in different, currencies but at the same time you know the dollar is still 80 percent of global trade so yes. and it hasn't really changed over the past yeah. few decades that's not to say that it's always going to be that way but anytime you're looking at those charts when you're comparing the dollar to the rest of the currencies in terms of its dominance for you know trade or anything invoice related um you have to look at the next best thing which yep. really isn't any competitor uh you know not to mention things like the renminbi are not convertible so i think you have to take that bigger picture view um, from a tactical perspective over the next couple of years, or maybe just over the next year, I think a synchronous global cutting cycle for, from all global central banks, so, you know, call it ECB and Fed and, you know, some some in, in Asia uh, broadly, but if it's just ECB and Fed, I'm not sure um, that that's going to lead to a lot of dollar weakness because there's not going to be much of a rate differential story there. Um, if the Fed were to hold on a lot longer and then the ECB were cutting aggressively, um, with other central banks, maybe that's a little bit of a different story. But yeah. even right now, you don't have everything in sync because the Bank of Japan is is hiking slowly, yeah. but hiking. <laughs> slowly, but hiking. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I I'm old enough, Kevin, to remember when uh, people were talking that the euro might overtake the uh, the dollar in terms oh, of a world yes. currency. That was very short lived. Same thing uh, with the yuan. Um, all right, uh, let's see. Got one more. Let's take it from David says with both gold and Bitcoin rising, isn't that an indication that inflation will be here with us longer and that perhaps rather than a cut, there might be a rate raise on the horizon? Um, you know, I'm not much of a of a gold or a Bitcoin analyst. I'm actually I'm not any of those. Um, but all I will say is just look at a chart of CPI year over year and the Bitcoin price um, and you could Pretty much see that it's not it was not an inflation hedge at all in fact it was right. the opposite from it's 21 the opposite to of what it was intended to you're it's, exactly it's right. completely done the opposite I, so that's kind of your answer right there to not look at either yeah. uh, well especially bitcoin i don't know about the price of gold because i don't have that chart in my head right now but 
um, to, to look at one as the inflation hedge, meaning Bitcoin or, or anything crypto related, I, I wouldn't do that um, just yep. because number one, limited history. Number two, um, there are other things that have proven to be much better inflation hedges like U.S. stocks. So uh, I think that, you know, I'll probably cap my analysis there, my, my analysis in air quotes. <laughs> I will. Uh, and I'll expand on that and just say that um, we've seen gold push towards all time highs. It pull back a little bit, but you've seen that across the whole commodity space. You've seen copper push up. You've seen silver push up. There's just been a lot of buying in the central banks. Uh, for gold as of late, you know, your normal players, but then you also seen, uh, you know, countries like Turkey step in. And so, yeah, no, there, there's been the central bank buying of the gold that I think has pushed that up a bit. But yeah, I, I'm going to agree with you 100% on that one, Kevin. I don't look at Bitcoin as an inflation hedge at all. So to me, that's a trade. But anyway, that's another discussion for another day. And Kevin, uh, at least for today, I truly, truly appreciate you tuning in uh, and helping us out. So thank you. Uh, thank you for all the fabulous work you did today. Always good uh, to see you. Always good to see you as well, sir. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. Watch for our replay. Uh, it'll be posted up on YouTube probably uh, in, I don't know, a few hours or so. So if you missed a, if you missed a live one, you can go check it out on YouTube uh, in, in a little bit. Okay. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks. Bye, everyone.